It's really a great pleasure and an honor to have with us uh, Professor Vladimir Kazunovic from uh, Texas A&M University. He's a regent professor and uh, Eugene E. Webb and Dole professor at uh, Texas A&M University. He's been there since uh, uh, 1986. Uh, he's one of the leading figures in the area of, of smart grids. I'm sure a lot of you know about his work. He, he's one of the people that works uh, between uh, universities and industry, and he has a lot of experience in that. Uh, he has, uh, he was, uh, he's the principal consultant as well as the president and CEO of Expert Power Associated, which has been providing consulting services for the utility industry for over 25 years. He has, um, he worked for Westinghouse Electric in the USA uh, as a systems engineer and developed the first all digital uh, substation designed during 1979 and 1980. Um, he, he acted as a consultant to over 50 utilities and vendors worldwide and served three terms as a director on the board of directors of the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel uh, representing research organizations and universities. He has been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Energy to serve on the Electricity Advisory Committee for the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, Professor um, Kazunovic was a principal investigator on over 120 R&D projects, uh, published more than 550 papers, and gave over 100 invited lectures, short courses, and seminars around the world. He's an IEEE Life Fellow and Distinguished Speaker, uh, a Secret Fellow, Honorary and Distinguished uh, Member, and Registered professional engineer in Texas. So um, uh, so clearly, uh, Professor Kozdinovich, it's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have him here as part of the GEOS, GEOS Distinguished Lecture Series, which the objective of the GEOS Distinguished Lecture Series is to bring um, uh, uh, researchers and academics of the, of the caliber of uh, Professor Kozdinovich uh, in order for the for the researchers at Kios to find more uh, about uh, some of the happenings that are going on in the, in, in the areas related to Kios, and definitely the topic of today's uh, uh, talk on big data uses in smart grids uh, is really a very timely uh, topic that a lot of the people at Kios are very much interested in. So uh, we are very happy to have you here and. Uh, and uh, we look forward. Thank you very much once again. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to apologize. I almost gave a lecture in downtown Nicosia. <laughs> I, I went all the way down. I missed it uh, anyway. Uh, so <laughs> I was lucky that I was actually able to find my way back and actually find the place. So I do apologize. It's a pleasure again to be here. I've been here before. It's interesting to compare. I've been here about eight years ago, gave a lecture. So I went to my lecture eight years before, and I looked so that I make sure I don't repeat myself again. Okay? <laughs> so, but uh, no, that's a, it's a little bit of a joke. I was looking at what I was talking about uh, last time was uh, trends in the smart grid. And uh, one was big data. And uh, eight years ago and now is a huge difference in this area, huge, in eight years, in, the, in three ways. Okay. First of all, the data that I will talk about became more and more available. That's the first thing. The other thing is the traditional data sciences approaches, signal processing approaches, were not necessarily directly applicable. Some things had to be done. So the progress on data analytics is not huge. Data is there. The progress is not huge. And the third is uh, utility companies are looking at big data with big expectations. They are expecting that something in their operation, bottom line, the cost, uh, will be, for example, reduced because of the use of the data. So those are the three things that have happened in the last uh, eight years. So now I will give you some details of that, and I will give some examples and things like that to give you a flavor of these things, what's going on. 
So I will quickly go over, over the smart grid domains and interactions. By the way, the smart grid is a buzzword, you know, it's used around the world. Some are using smarter grid, and, but it's a base for the future grid, what's next? And uh, interestingly enough, smart grid is a term that comes from a law in the United States that was passed, a lot of people don't know this, in 2007, that is called ESA law. <coughs> Energy um, uh, Independence and Security Act. 2007. In the Article 13 of that law, for the first time, officially, smart grid word was used, or, or a set of words were used. So it comes from, from the law. I will talk about the problems that we're trying to solve, expectations, sources of data, challenges. I'll give a few examples. So the domain, the traditional domains are operations, service providers, markets, generation, transmission, customers. One thing to note from the beginning, the big data and smart grids is not only the data that comes from the grid that we are, or the utilities are measuring, it's also the data that comes from outside, other energy markets, particularly gas in the United States. Uh, weather, weather data is extremely important in power systems. It's been known for years and years that it's important. But the level of weather data we're using now, the sources, the complexity of it, the dynamics of it, has never been used in the utility industry before. And you will see that in the examples. And then the environment. We, we are aware that we, are, we all worry about the environment. So the environmental requirements are driving uh, a lot of issues with renewables and things like that that also create a lot of data. This chart comes from the original NIST. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology chart, except they didn't have those three clouds at the top that I've had. And this is the ecosystem, that, that is the integrated system. Electricity is one thing that we're looking at. Gas and oil comes with it. Water system. I, if I had time, I could talk about these things forever. You know, professors always like to talk, so I can talk forever. But if I had the time, I would show you some maps, for example, from a given year in the United States. How many power plants were shut down because there was lack of water? I mean, it's a real thing. In Texas, where I come from, we have a shortage of water, big time. So the water is a big deal. The built environment, it's a technical term that architects use uh, to describe anything that is built, we are referring to putting in pol uh, solar, you know, rooftop solar or electrical vehicle chargers or something like that. So that's the term that comes with that. Transportation. You would say, what does the transportation have to do with the, you know, electricity grid? <coughs> well, think about an electrical vehicle. It charges here, here being your home. You travel somewhere to work or whatever and you are connected here to charge, you may be connected somewhere else to even discharge, let alone to charge. The travel through the transportation system is affecting the state of charge on the battery. So it does matter where you go and how long you spend on driving and so on. And now I'm telling you about these integrated uh, environments because the data from all of these domains may be of interest, right? And then the computer information systems, they are pervasive, they are everywhere. I don't need to tell you about that, you know more than I do how pervasive that is. And then the uh, connectivity itself, the, the, the internet of things, you know, as, as, as much as it is a, a buzz, another buzzword, it is happening. I mean, we are connecting more and more technical systems uh, rather than just people. And uh, a lot of utilities in the United States are looking at uh, you know, connecting to uh, either private net networks or, or some sort of open network with, with security, depending what type of data is uh, being communicated. The underlying requirement of the big data is to have good communications. If you don't have good communications, how are you, you, know, you going to get access to data? So the data is distributed. By the way, this is a side comment. A lot of people back in the States are talking about pulling the data that we need in one place and then you know, processing. That's never going to happen as far as I can understand. 
people will want to keep the data where it is. There will be techniques how to access data in a distributed way, but not to merge the data. So that's another piece of, of a problem. You have to have a software that is pretty good for accessing data and then for regulating the access, because you have to regulate the access. You can't just say, well, everybody can go whichever place. So it's not only the cloud that we're talking about. It's actual physical databases in a given company. In a utility company, there's no single database in the United States. They have multiple databases just within the company, let alone any other databases that you want to access. So that's an issue to consider. All right, so that's a very broad brushed uh, overview of what's happening. Now, a few problems here uh, to discuss. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I tend to kind of a pound on one problem, even though there are multiple problems. One problem that is very important is we are experiencing outages, major outages around the world. And the outages are not going down, the outages are going up. So if you look at the statistics of what's going, you know, what has happened in India, in Europe, in the United States, around the world, major outages are going down. So one problem that is logical to try to address using the big data is, can I do something about outages? Right. Now, side comment. I'll, I'll kind of link these side comments at one point in time. But the side comment is, the key in everything we want to do as far as that. Remember, this is a biased lecture. This is not something, you know, it's my opinion, so you can take them for whatever they are worth. But I strongly believe that we should look at the predictive techniques. Predictive, using the data. Machine learning, you know, to predict. Now, somebody who is close to the power systems may say, well, how are you going to predict outputs? You actually can predict outputs. You can. Okay, so that's the point. Now, why the prediction is so important? If you have something predicted, you do have the time to mitigate, to try to do something about it. Typically today, when the power goes out, everything is reactive. We try to restore, you know, and, and to restore as soon as we can. But it's reactive. It already has happened, and we're trying to do our best. Uh, so those are the statistics about now weather-related outages are going up in particular. Now, most of the power system, most, is overhead. We have in the cities, you know, underground cables and so on. Those cables and transformers and all of that that is underground is also affected by the weather. How? Flooding, for example. We have a coastal area, as you know, in Texas, the Gulf, and we have a three or four utilities, major utilities serving that, the AP Texas, Center Point in Houston, Entergy, Gulf utilities and so on. When they get these surges of water due to the hurricanes and so on, it floods everything. And so that affects the cables and the transformers and things like that. So uh, the, the weather is a big deal. Overhead, we are exposed. I'm not an advocate of uh, whether there is a climate change, what pace or whatever. I, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking I, I cannot do anything myself necessarily about that. Even though one may say we all can, but I'm kind of a practical. Hence, I'm not going to worry about the causes. I'm going to worry about manifestations. And manifestations in the United States, you know, I lived in Texas for 31 years. And I can tell you there is a difference of weather extremes, uh, you know, from now, 10 years ago, or, or 10 years prior to that. There is a difference. The extremes are uh, bigger, and the uh, oscillations are, are more frequent. And it's just the fact. And so all of that is affecting uh, the outages. Since I am pounding on the outages, I want to show you something here. Those are the statistics, these pie charts, that come from different sources. And I have intentionally selected the sources from the utilities in the north, in the south, from other agencies that are doing these estimates and so on, to show that all these pie charts are the causes for uh, uh, outages. If you look carefully at these charts, uh, the equipment failure and the weather causes are uh, covering more than 50% in each chart. So now that tells you something about what to collect in terms of data to try actually to predict the outages. Obviously, 
the status of the equipment. So all of the maintenance data, all of the sensors coming from that are very, very important in this particular situation, this particular problem, as well as the weather data. And the first thing to note is those are different things. You know, you look at the grid, you measure some things from the grid, and then you look at the weather, you measure some things in the weather. And so uh, that is what is uh, driving this uh, reason for integrating, merging data, uh, integrating the data. These charts should be read from left to right, and then from, from again, from left to right. First of all, if you're not familiar with these charts, they come from Gartner. Gartner is the technology uh, forecast company. And they make these, these charts that are described here, where they say the technology starts to picking up, uh, expectations start to go up, and then a realization of implementation comes, and it's kind of a, expectations are kind of a going down, and then at one point in time, the technology either makes it or not. If it does make it, then it gradually starts kind of a being adopted. So that's the chart that they've seen uh, most of the technologies following. So what's interesting here in this chart, I do apologize, it's pretty kind of a, I don't know if you can read it or not, but we're tracking big data uh, on this chart. It has many things, many other things. So it's in the square. You can see the square up there in 2013 or 12, whatever that year is, there was a very high expectation uh, from big data, very high. It started going down on this, tr on this chart in 2014, 2015, and I suspect, I don't have a, a 2017, but I suspect it's somewhere here now. So even, this is a general big data expectation. This is not an empowered case, this is general. So what does that tell you? It's, un it's not explored enough. It's kind of a, we all talk about it, but we don't, we don't do much about it, you know. Now, some people are making huge progress in medicine, for example, and it's very logical. You know, in medicine, each of us is a patient. You can imagine how many patients are out there. Each of us has so many measurements in the files, if I could call them measurements, you know, the pressure, the whatever you know, they take when we go. And so medicine <coughs> is all over this, okay? Uh, why I'm mentioning these areas, that's where we should look for what they are using to see whether some of that is applicable to what we want. The other area is um, insurance, and you wouldn't think that they would look at this, or they, they look at this big time, big time the big day. Okay, insurance, uh, banking, cybersecurity industry. Why? They are tracking uh, traffic and trying to understand from the traffic what's happening, traffic on the communication links and so on. So that's another big area. And of course, military. The defense is looking at this I mean, a lot. And, and so those are some of the uh, industries that are looking at. Now, this is not readable, I know that. But what I wanted to do here is to show you a, uh, a chart that, that basically uh, tells you how many industries in different functionalities, uh, like analytics or, or management of data, or whatever these types are, how many companies are emerging. There are a lot of companies that are standard, you know, companies in this business, like IBM. But there are a lot of new companies, startups and things like that, a lot. And it's just everywhere. Now, this may or may not be of interest, so I will kind of uh, skip this. It talks about expectations of investments in different industries. Um, anyway, you can see that big data is coming, I mean, people are investing in that. Now, the smart grid big data is growing by leaps and bounds. And you can imagine, uh, just from, you know, not digging too far, take two or three technologies. Take the smart meter technology, just that. In the United States, in the city of Houston, there are probably 1.5 million meters. They are reporting every 15 minutes. But there's nothing preventing us to report every second if we want to. That's another thing about this, the time resolution of the reporting and the measurements. So you can calculate 1.5 million times every second. There's a, and it's all data. Okay. By the way, in the United States, in the power systems community, 
There's a lot of activity in the pan-engineering society on big data, you know, panels, this and that. I chaired a few, I attended a few, and I keep telling everybody in PS, folks, what we're talking about is not big data. It's maybe 5% of everything that we talk about in PES is big data. So there's a difference between data analytics per se, data mining and so on, on relatively small data sets versus large data sets. You know, terabytes are not large. That's not a large set. It's much more than that, okay? And we are talking about smaller, smaller amounts. But nevertheless, the source in power systems can produce large amount of data, right? The other technology is synchrophasing technology. I don't know how familiar you are, but we are sampling waveforms across the grid in a few hundred places. And uh, the sampling is driven with a clock that is uh, controlling the uh, A to B converters. So they are all uh, uh, sampling the whole uh, uh, circuits before the A to B converters for holding the value to convert. They are clocked uh, in a microsecond range, microsecond range. And then we get uh, samples, and then we calculate phasers. And we calculate phasers 30 <coughs> times, 60 times, 120 times, 240 times a second. And that's happening continuously, so it's a streaming day. Okay. Now, if you ignore for a minute calculation of the phaser. If you just look at the samples, there are a lot of samples collected. And the technology is such that, I'll, I'll give you a Texas example. In Texas, we have uh, about uh, 5,000 buses, as we call it, in the power system. So that's the size of the power system. And we have about 100 PMUs, phaser measurement units, installed. So 4,000, 5,100 is kind of a, not a large number. But we have about 10,000 relays just at the transmission, 10,000 relays. Each relay can be converted tomorrow through firmware to a PMU. <clears throat> so you can jump from 100 to 10,000, several orders of money, if you wanted to do that, if there was a reason. And that would create a lot of data in that case. Right. So we are on that path. Again, aside from all of you that are in signal processing, uh, I would like to learn something from you. How do I define the phaser in a dynamic environment that changes frequency, magnitude, and angle all the time? <coughs> How do I define the phaser? And by the way, this question hasn't been answered until today. Now, there, there might have been papers out there that we are not aware of. You know, maybe, maybe when Fourier or somebody wrote something, I don't know when, uh, maybe they wrote something about this, just theoretically. But in the practical world, we don't have solutions for this question. We struggled that in the standardization in IEEE. We struggled in trying to develop applications. So we struggled. So that's a side comment. The side comment being, if you have a streaming data, which is samples, time series samples, and the data represents a, a dynamic system, nonlinear dynamic system. How do you characterize the system? What are the features that you want to compute? Phaser is one typical feature that we like to compute in our systems. But uh, how is it defined? What is the model for that phase? Then we're trying to fit from the data. So anyway, uh, that's changing dramatically. Now, let me talk about the sources. Besides utility measurements, we have market data. Market data is its not a lot of data, but still there are a lot of participants in the market. But what's interesting about all of this is the markets in the United States clear every five minutes. So settlements are done every five minutes. So you can imagine that certain decisions have to be made very quickly because the transactions, the amount of money that is in these transactions is in billions of dollars in a given year, billions of dollars. So that's one source. The other source is uh, lightning data. I guess you get lightning around here. We have, do you have a lightning detection network here in Cyprus? Okay, so in the, in the United States, we have lightning detection networks. 
that are spread uh, around. Uh, there's a company from Finland called Vaisala that uh, kind of uh, supports these networks and maintains them and sells the data. And so we can capture all the you know, lightning strikes and stuff like that where they occur. Uh, weather forecasts. Weather comes from multiple sources, as you may know, from land stations, from radars, from satellites, from uh, uh, mobile sources, airplanes, stuff like that. They carry sensors for weather also. Some of you that work on the wind stuff, you, you know how difficult it is to get actual wind you know, at, the, at the height that you want and, and so on. So uh, all those sources of data, vegetation, uh, you may say, why vegetation? Well, vegetation grows into the lines and creates faults. Believe it or not, in Texas, Texas uh, Forest Service has documented every single tree in Texas. I, I guess they didn't have anything to do. I, I don't know. <laughs> no, every single tree is documented. So when we do, when I show you the example and we run a feeder, we know exactly what species of the of the, of the trees are underneath that uh, feeder. Exactly. And so that's interesting. What is this? This is the, the uh, population of squirrels in Texas. Squirrels. Why squirrels? Well, these little things cause faults. They chew on the lines and things like that, and they cause faults. As a matter of fact, it's a major cause. I don't want to go back to these pie charts, but you will see the animals causing <coughs> snakes and stuff like that. So that data is available, asset data, measurements of the parts of the power system. Uh, the unnamed aerial systems or aerial vehicles, the drones, they are becoming more and more popular for various reasons in the power systems. I don't know how familiar you are with the drones, but they collect a lot of data. Those are the camera resolution data very, very quickly. And one side comment again, for those of you that are doing something on the data compression, uh, the main problem with all this data is if you have a distributed database and you want to manage these databases, it's one issue. If you want to transfer the data, it's another issue. You know, I keep telling my students, don't send me emails with long attachments. Because it, at these hotels, it takes forever to download that particular email. And it's blocking all of the other emails. Well, last night I went to bed and I left the computer working, hoping that it's going to download everything. And so, okay, it's not that bad of all these you know, communication networks that we have, but it depends how much data you push, right? So that's a pretty good source of data, and the GIS, very important in power systems. We want to process data in spatial and temporal framework. It's very important to us what's here versus what's there, and whether it's at this moment in time or a few minutes later or whatever. Side comment, this leads, and I'm pretty sure some of you are working on this, on graph-based data nodes. So where I have my graph nodes, I have my links between the nodes, and I'm assigning my graph nodes to different nodes uh, where the data is. Incidentally, it's very important to have a technique that can take data from different sources into these nodes and process them in one plane, in one uh, you know, time uh, 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 interval. Um, you saw what kind of data that is. Streaming data, data from satellites, data from animal uh, migration, different time scales, and you're trying to merge it into one processing framework. Extremely different. So anyway, those are the sources of data. And this is also quite important that, uh, as I said, uh, <coughs> data comes from different uh, domains. I have just indicated three here technologies that I mentioned, these interfaces, smart data, and assets as something to look at. Uh, this is already what I discussed, the weather data itself. Uh, now, in the weather data, there are a few things that are extremely important. Forecasts. You, you will see that uh, in a minute that we have defined, this is us, we have defined our interest in this data analytics and all of that uh, to represent that as risk maps. 
that are spatially and temporarily distributed. And in the risk, the definition of risk we're using is hazard times vulnerability times economic impact. The hazard, in our case, is most related to the weather. So we're looking at all kinds of the forecasts for weather that we can use for different purposes. Vulnerability is a conditional probability that something will happen under that particular weather hazard. And when we multiply that with the value, we get the risk maps. You will see examples of the risk maps. So depending what you are trying to do with this weather, um, your, your forecast may have to be every 15 minutes, or every three or four hours, or every day or two, or every quarter, depending what you are trying to calculate the risk for. Okay. Now, uh, you know these are kind of uh, things that you know. Four V's actually we define the eight V's ourselves. So, <laughs> and, and this gives you a little bit more of data uh, properties, uncertainties. Uh, things like that from different sources. The time scales. I mentioned the time scale several times in power systems. It's unbelievable. We have clocks that are basically in a nanosecond accuracy range. This is the accuracy of the clocks, the GPS clocks. And we plan all the way to basically years and everything in between. We typically draw a line somewhere here where everything has to be automated up to seconds. The operator is going to do anything, you know, in milliseconds. So all the processing has to be automated up to that range. And then after that range, we may have operators in the loop after that. Uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, as I told you, uh, big data, Big expectations. Everybody wants something out of that. And nobody knows exactly what yet. So there are a lot of opportunities, uh, but there are a lot of challenges. This is kind of a generic. So one uh, challenge is to define what we want to do with the data. Because, you know, a typical reaction of, of students, for example, is to jump on one source of data, not to think about integration, just jump on one, and then wonder what to do with that source. And it may be more challenging to do that than to correlate that to something else that makes sense to correlate. And so the question is, what do you want to do with it? Um, I, you know, I'm, about, I'm writing a paper. I don't know if I should tell you what the title will be, because I'm just writing it. But I'll give you a hint. You know, we, we tend to say something, let's say big data, is a journey rather than destination. That's typically used to say, well, we are exploring things. OK. I think my title will be big data, destination, not a journey. You know, you need to know what are you trying to solve before you try to solve the problem. In order to need to, to know what to solve, you need to correlate to the industry to see what is their problem. Because you may be using big data to solve the problem that doesn't need the big data and is not a problem. And I see that left and right in the published papers. Now, don't get me wrong, the science has to move forward. The science doesn't have to have a very specific objective in terms of solving very specific problems of the day. The science can move forward. But the life has to move forward too. And the life is full of problems. Utilities, as I told you, blackouts, this and that. Somebody has to solve it. If we all were scientists, uh, scientists and moving the science forward, we would be you know, not having the lights, I guess. So we have to solve the problems. And therefore, this uh, concept of defining what it is and so on. Now, besides the data sources, data analytics, visualization is the next thing. <coughs> and, and how to visualize something that is to start with big data. So that means, basically, what are the features that can be extracted and shown? Because the data itself cannot be shown. 
sort of the trends and things like that. So we have to think about it. Secondly, when we are using these complex data sources and correlating them, the, the simple 2D representation of something <coughs> may or may not work. We may have to go in 3D. We may have to go in extended reality and virtual reality. We may have to do it just because of the complexity of the representation. Okay? Decision making. In the utility industry, you know, we have this kind of a term situational awareness or dashboards. If you look at the smart meter vendors, they will say, well, we collect data, we have dashboards. And what is a dashboard? Well, we show you the trends of data. So what? In the control house, situational awareness. What do you mean by that? In the control house, everything that is done is done by the book, literally. Every decision is described in the book. If this, then this. So being aware that something is jumping all over the place is not going to get you to a decision. So the operator is not going to make a decision. Remember, they have displays in the control room. I don't know if you've been there. From you know weather displays to power system displays to the sports displays. They watch football and stuff like that because their shifts are very long. So they look at a lot of things. But the decisions are made only on certain things that are defined ahead of the time in terms of if this, then this. And so we have to think about that in that last step. <coughs> now, in the United States, all these things that we're talking about uh, losing electricity cost money. So this map shows how much in billions of dollars we lose every year in the United States due to the loss of electricity, about $150 billion. So it's a real thing to solve. Now, what we would ideally want to have is something like this. These are predictive maps that are developed uh, by the US disaster, uh, whatever, FEMA or something like that. It says for different uh, events, what are the risks? But those are very coarse uh, representations. We would like to hit, for example, Texas and get a risk map that is as granular as every home and every business and every transmission line to see what the risk is on that. That's what the ultimate goal would be. So now, let me uh, go into opportunities. Uh, by the way, I know I was late, I know it's a lunchtime, so if you want me to stop, I will. If you want me to continue, I will. I have another 15 minutes or so. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, again, uh, yeah. sorry for being late. All right, so, so anyway, this is how we define the risk. Uh, uh, the, the, the way how we work on this is, uh, I know it's a complicated uh, figure, but it, you can correlate every single component of the power system, every single component, to particular weather threats and particular levels of hazard and so on. And what's interesting is you need to do it because an insulator, for example, the transmission line in Cyprus that is next to the coastline is not going to be affected the same way as it is inland in Korea. And, and, and so, you know, it, it, everything in the utility is spatial and it's different. Right now, all of our techniques are failure rate of something is average and hence every insulator, that's the probability of failure. No, it depends how much it was exposed to what type of weather over what period of time. And that is different from location to location. Now, you may say, well, you know, it's pretty difficult to do that. Well, as a matter of fact, it's not that difficult to do it. We looked at uh, insulators in Sarah Point in, in Houston we took a few lines, and yes, there were you know, thousands of insulators and things like that, but we kind of developed the, you know, the data analytics to track the uh, st state of each insulator to look at the lightning strikes and acidity to the insulator and uh, uh, over voltages created on the lines and things like that. So it's all unique to every single location. So you can do it. And when you do it, it's a lot of data. And so that's the big data problem. I'll skip it. This requires a little bit more discussion. So this is the most interesting part. Examples. I, I think that's the most interesting part. 
So again, the same uh, uh, discussion, except we are now applying it to lightning strikes and insulators. So the, uh, the hazards are associated with the probability of uh, lightning strikes. You know, uh, the world, I don't know how to say this and, and not sound, uh, you know, the world looks random in many ways, and it is random. I mean, we define it with a lot of random you know, variables. But there are a lot of patterns in these things. You know, if you take a map of a utility company and you look where the lightning strikes took place, uh, and that was detected by the lightning detection network, you will see clustering exactly of the lightning strikes through over 20, 30 years. And the reason is it's caused by things like elevation, vicinity of the trees, and things like that, which is exposing some areas more than the others. And so that's how these strikes actually form. So uh, you could develop that. The economic impact is the most difficult thing, and we typically leave it to the utilities to define. So we tell them this is what the tool is, and you need to define how you put the money on these things so that we can get these risks uh, scaled to the money that you think it's worth. The whole story about insulators in this particular example is from a curve like this that is determined, this is a breakdown curve for the insulators, uh, that is determined at the time of testing of the product. Uh, we are actually able to calculate how the curve moves for each insulator depending on the conditions around that insulator. So the concept is very, very simple. That's what we're trying to do. Because when you move this curve, then the failure rates change. And so can you estimate how this curve moves at every single display? Uh, so when you look at what we are doing, we are mostly adding some things and geography. The spatial component is big. And these other things are used by other techniques that are in place today. This is a little bit of that uh, math that is used. Um, uh, there, there are nodes, there are certain dependencies between them. Uh, the nodes here are substations where some measurements are done, as well as the weather stations. And uh, what's interesting here is we are trying to calculate the new BIL, which is this representation of the curve, the, the uh, breakdown uh, coefficient. And look at what's going into that. The lightning current, the temperature, precipitation, humidity, pressure, old BIL. All kinds of different things that are not necessarily the same type of data. They are all going into the same computational framework. And, and I used to calculate uh, updates of this BIL as these other parameters change. And what are we getting? We are getting the risk maps. So this is a, I don't know how well you see it, but these, these are supposedly transmission lines. And these are the colors of the risk that each insulator on each line has. You can enlarge this, and you would, think, you would see thousands and thousands and thousands of insulators. And they would all have these colors associated with it. Okay. The other one is the vegetation risk uh, model. Uh, I don't know how it is in Cyprus. From what I'm driving around, some areas are kind of a long tree, some areas are not. So vegetation management in, in the United States, in the South particularly, where we live, is huge expense for utilities, huge. They are trimming the trees, basically, so that they don't touch the uh, insulators. They don't have enough crew uh, to do it. So what they do is they kind of go around and say, we're trimming this feeder and this feeder, and then after about two or three years, they come back to the first feeder. So it takes about two or three years to go around all the feeders. And that's their asset management for vegetation. They have a fixed budget that means fixed crew goes and, and does the, the things. So what would be ideal in this? Three things. One thing would be if it was spatial and temporal. In other words, if we were able to differentiate the risk that is down to a section of the feeder, not even the feeder, section of the feeder. So if I was telling somebody, listen, your highest risk, you know, on feeder one, this segment, on feeder 50, this segment, on feeder 100, that segment, go and trim that, right? So that's the first element. The second element is 
an optimization of how the resource would be allocated to do this. And the third one is the time. How often I should look at these maps? Should I look at these maps every morning when I wake up, or should I look at these maps once a quarter? So it depends on how am I scheduling the maintenance. Sometimes maintenance is scheduled on a quarterly basis, sometimes on a monthly basis, sometimes on a daily basis, so I have to differentiate that. So um, again, the same equation. Uh, what goes into what? Uh, vulnerability, hazard, uh, calculations, and so on. Uh, and so finally, what we get is this. We get overlays between uh, the hazard, the uh, vulnerability, and then when we overlay that, we get actually the um, risk maps. So now, if you are familiar with this problem, you will find that some companies like IBM have addressed this problem a long, long time ago, vegetation management. But they didn't, they didn't get it, so to speak. All they looked at was the history of outages. And they try to, based on the history of outages, to machine learning to, to predict where the outages might be. But what they didn't realize is that the weather is driving some of these things. And the vegetation properties are driving some of these things. So when we implemented this, we used all the information that I was mentioning earlier. The vegetation, the uh, uh, various weather parameters, and things like that, in addition to the outage. And obviously, the result, more accurate predictions. Simple as that. So this is roughly how it would work. Uh, this is uh, after the optimization is applied. So there are certain sections. You, you don't see these, but these are colors, and they have different grids, basically. All of these are feeders in these squares. And so the question is, how do you order the, the trimming schedules? how much you're reducing the risk and what is the economic impact. So that's an optimization problem that you need to do to solve this uh, optimal way of uh, reducing the risk. Yes, that's the problem. So that's that. Uh, again, you know, there are many conclusions here, but you learned some of those. So I, okay, I, I am where I should have been 15 minutes ago, <laughs> if I started 15 minutes before. So. But I, I would be glad to uh, answer questions because I, I really uh, would like to kind of uh, engage at least for a few minutes. If, if you need to go to eat, I'm not offended. Yeah, you know, just just we leave. don't eat very often. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the United States we are kind of at twelve. Yeah. Even though here I've been eating, that's all I was doing. So I don't <laughs> see the food anymore. <laughs> it's a great food, I do see it, which I love. And so, okay. So, what are the questions that you may have, or or comments for that? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you all for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is about, I would like to hear your comment regarding um, data delays and the necessity of to upgrade the communication infrastructure or in the transmission grid uh, in order to move on to the smart grid concept because in the way I see it, uh, the smart grid is tightly connected with the real-time applications. You need to monitor a real time at some point, and then uh, after the real time as well. Yeah, it, it's a very broad question, you know, because it covers all kinds of applications. In the power systems, we're dealing, as I said before, with uh, automated functions that are below a, a second. And so there's one problem with that, how to get the loops closed, including communications for that kind of operation. Then we have operators in the loop that also have to react fairly quickly. In, in matters of uh, seconds or minutes, okay? So that's another time scale. And then we have a lot of applications that are in the operations planning range, which is an hour ahead, day ahead, month ahead. And then we have the planning functions that are year. Big data is applicable to all of these time frames. So obviously, in these uh, longer time frames, the delays are not that important. But the quality of data is important. The problem is that, as you know, 
uh, when you have a very intensive communication, if you don't have a very good communication system, the packets need, uh, you know, tend to drop and, and, and things like that. So you need additional time to retransmit and, and so on. So you, you know, the communication network, uh, reliable communication network, is the, the most important thing almost, you know, to, to, to have. But uh, in real time, you have to kind of focus on dedicated networks. So most of the networks that are used in the protection, for example, are dedicated networks. Whether they are leased or private, they are dedicated. And so we you know, run fiber optic cables, we run microwave, we, we run different things, wireless for that matter, also on a shorter lines. And so, you know, People are kind of a solving you know, the problems that they need to solve. Uh, now comes the, the issue of big data and how it may require you know, more transmission or something like that. The very few things in power systems are done just based on segments in time domain. They are mostly done uh, based on uh, features that are extracted. So one of the things to look for is what are the features to extract as close to the source as possible so that you you know, extracting feature is a form of a compression base. You, know, you, you calculate something and you know, uh, it consists of so many samples and you only send it one thing. And then you can do compression on, on these features. You know. so, so that's one way. But what we found from our work is this. The problem is not necessarily in time delays or, or whatever. Uh, it is in the quality of data. In this vegetation management project that we developed a full production type uh, uh, demonstration in the utility company in, in Houston, probably 80% of the time was spent on uh, processing data and making sure that the data is reliant. 80% of the time. And so that's what where the first problem is before you even communicate. Because we can communicate garbage and it's not a problem, you know, and, and then what, so what? So anyway, it's a long answer to a short question, but uh, that's been our experience. Other questions? Any other questions? Yes, we'll go there and then here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's a really great talk. Uh, it seems that you, you, uh, the data you have shown is essentially uh, open data. Uh, it seems that you are using a lot of data from different sources and opposed that a power, a power company, a power utility will not have access. Uh, they will not be producing uh, you know, lighting data or uh, you know, the population of squares, etc. So they are relying, they, are, they, they, they should rely, as far as I understood, on open data, data provided by other, by, by other organizations. So, um, uh, so what, what's the experience in that? Because Okay, so here's, here's the experience. Uh, you know, open data, open software, open this and that is a kind of a term that needs to be clarified. Um, you know, there, there are li licenses associated with open something. And so we are not quite talking about this yet. Even though, by the way, we are advocating that there should be licenses for the use of data. But that's a different discussion. Okay. But this is the issue. Utility companies <coughs> in the United States are prohibited to <coughs> share data by the act that is called CEII Act, Critical Infrastructure for Electricity or something like that. That is a FERC, Federal Regulatory Commission, Commission law. Now, they can share the data under non-disclosure agreements and special agreements with the contractors. So when we do the work with them, we sign all these agreements. And after you sign the agreements, which are very, very strict agreements, for example, the data shall reside on the computers that don't have any communication associated with it. Not connected to a network. And things like that. Okay. So once you sign it, you get it. So that's one part. That's the private data of the utility company. The data from outside, some of that data is open data. That comes from the government <coughs> organizations. In the United States, NOAA uh, is, is one that does the weather data. And you can go and download this and that from NOAA and download forecasts and whatever. Uh, the other source is data for money. You know, you buy data. So Vaisala for lighting detection sells data. Whether it's selling to me or selling to utility company or somebody else, it's selling data. And there are a few companies like that that sell data. Right? Um, 
we <coughs> were able to strike deals with these companies to say, listen, we're doing something that is maybe of use to you commercially, so we would like you to open some data to us to work, and we'll in return share some of the results with you, and so you can learn. Because some of these companies, you know, they, they have data, but they don't really know how people may use the data. So there's some value in uh, uh, learning what can be done. So uh, we had a lot of attempts in the United States to make some sort of agreements that are kind of uh, umbrella agreements for sharing data, and it failed left and right. You know, one of the organizations is NASPI, North American Synchrophaser Initiative. Uh, they wanted to share, uh, you know, synchrophaser data. It fell apart. Nobody wanted to sign an umbrella agreement. So it has to be one-to-one -one and you know, things like that. But the data in general becomes available after all these agreements are signed. Did, did you have a Yeah, thank you for such a very interesting talk. Uh, my question was, uh, you mentioned one of the biggest challenges to be the visualization, to generate features, as you call them. And this is uh, something quite interesting. I come from a background of computer vision, which is actually mm. real time. Uh, can you give us a few more insights on how you can generate those features? It's just a special temporary relationship. Uh, I, I'll give you some examples. They may or may not sound uh, useful, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, some examples. Um, when we show the power system on a map, uh, on the wall, you know, the display, we show some lines and we show some like breakers and stuff like that. Those are switches. So when something happens, you can zoom in into section and, and see which breaker opened and so on. <coughs> But uh, if you are interested in the failures of the breakers and you want to know what, uh, how the mechanism is uh, failing, you need to go inside the breaker with the model. And so we developed a visual representation 3D of the breaker. So when the breaker is open on the line, operator can click and can see how the mechanism has operated for the control signals that we record. So we replay back the control signals and we see what the breaker was doing. And based on that, we can decide. Now, that representation is a, is a, a 3D representation. <laughs> Another um, example is a big jump now to the um, homes, for example. There's a lot of discussion about robots these days uh, used for uh, utility power systems. Obviously, robots are used for many things, but for power systems. And uh, talk, people are talking about these robotariums, you know, where you have hundreds of robots and whatever. But imagine this. Let's say my wife or my daughter, they have no clue about electricity or relation between if they turn something and how much we can pay, or they just, they just don't have a clue. And we are trying to develop an energy management system for the home. And we have smart appliances, let's say. So sensors are on dishwashers and, and stoves and whatever. In order to get my wife, my daughter, you know, to use this, some other mechanism has to exist that can take the data and some behavioral elements of, of them, my wife and my daughter, and make decisions about optimization. So let's assume you call that a robot. It can be a physical robot that walks around the home, it would be fun to have it, or it can be a, a virtual robot. Okay. So now, ask yourself, how would you represent all of this? The appliances, the you know, uh, rooms, the, the, the robot that supposedly you know, goes around, makes decisions, and all of that. You are in the realm of uh, computer games at that point. And so that technology, if you think about it, these platforms that exist, you could, you could embed all of this in these platforms. So whatever these platforms use, and they use you know, extended reality, virtual reality, you name it for these games these days, that can actually be translated to this problem that I was defining. So those are the kinds of things that need to be explored. Okay? Um, I, I don't want to say that we have any you know, spectacular solutions yet. The, Graphics in the utility industry are very primitive in comparison to medicine and some other you know, fields. And so there's plenty to explore, plenty to explore. Other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, um, So, you know, using uh, big data for, for 
smart grid is, you know, it's a lot of overhead. So you need to get all this data, process the data, store the data, make decisions. And of course, like you said, there's also these issues that some of the data may not be good data, it might be faulty data, and that may lead to uh, wrong decisions. So <coughs> in order to be worth it, then you need uh, some important applications in the smart grid, and you identified uh, the area of outages, which is a very serious problem and it can be caused. What are some of the other applications you think in the smart grid that would that would be worth the big data? <coughs> there, there are two other applications. One is cybersecurity. Okay, particularly cyber physical security. Because in that case, you have to look at the data from the grid and the data from the cybersecurity sensors or, or traffic or whatever you're trying to monitor. That right now is a big problem, A. In the United States, I don't know Cyprus, I have no idea, but in the United States, the grid is attacked all the time. Absolutely all the time. And we it's not talked about uh, widely, but we know that, right? So the people are just simply interested in figuring out what to do. And the way how you can tell that it's a big problem is by looking at the solicitations that are coming out. Solicitation out of the defense, solicitation out of the you know, uh, DOE, solicitation out of NSF. Uh, a lot of these solicitations are based uh, looking at the cybersecurity of the grid. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem worth looking at. The only problem is it's hard to put your hands around because nobody has put the figure on the cybersecurity you know, yet. They know how much they spend but they don't know how much they have to spend. So when you are arguing that you know, you're doing this and they should invest in it, it's a little bit more difficult. With vegetation management, it's very clear. You know, they are spending this much money on vegetation. If you can cut it by 20%, it's a huge amount of money. But that's one area. The other area is this balancing, no faults whatsoever, just balancing the variability in the system from renewables, uh, in this case, in, in Cyprus, and so on. More. Well, maybe wind too, I guess. And, uh, you know, uh, so, so that your load and your generation can, can be, you know, balanced in, in real time. Those are the problems of the forecasts. As you know, everybody's forecasting solar, everybody's forecasting wind, I mean, everybody and his brother. And so the question is, do we have the best forecasts now? And every improvement in that can also get the money attached to it. Okay, okay. So we are, for example, bidding right now, I'm writing a proposal with some students and some other people on a new method to forecast solar. And one can say, well, oh my God, you know, we've been beating this horse for a long time. Yes, we've been beating that horse, but we still don't have you know, the, the best solutions we could. And so those are the areas where also one can uh, gain some real you know, uh, you know, benefit. So, so that's where I, well, let me put it this way. I am focusing on those areas. All those areas. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm betting my bets on, on what I should be betting, I don't know, but uh, I'm betting it on it. So. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I want to thank you and I want to point out this flyer that I brought with me. That's a conference on signal phasers uh, next year, and you're welcome to come. I again appreciate very much the hospitality. Oh,